first of all, in terms of what happened yesterday, um, is it just a matter of luck that no British servicemen and women were killed yesterday? I, I think what I would say is it, it could have been us. We were just in a different place. I think that's what I would say. And, and I think we have to, you know, tonight uh, or last night, uh, another American Marine died. It was 13 were killed, over 20 injured and between 60 to 80 Afghans murdered by this awful bomb. So it's pretty horrendous without any regard for who these people were. Um, ISIS have, as a terrorist group, no regard for human life or indeed for fellow Muslims, or indeed for anyone else. They are absolutely uh, the most abhorrent of all the terrorist organizations we have to deal with. And, uh, you know, f for what purpose was it? What was it? You know, pointless. Well, in indeed, um, that, that as, as a result, that did uh, stop flights for some time. But I know evacuation flights did continue overnight. We've got 13,700 total evacuated so far, 1,429 in the last 24 hours on nine flights. So managed to get those flights up and running again. But you've announced today that uh, all flights are going to end for civilians, both Brits and uh, Afghans today. Um, how many more people do you hope to get out? And why are you ending today? Why can you not extend even one more day? So, um, yes, in, in the middle of the night last night, I authorised the closing of the evacuation handling centre, which was often called the Barons Hotel. <clears throat> and that's where we had about 500 troops and we were processing uh, with the consular services and the border force people uh, through that um, issue. That was closed. Uh, and then they took those 800 eligible people that were inside with them across into the airfield and they are being processed today and the gates are now closed and sealed and uh, there will be no more call forward uh, and uh, those people airside will be processed and if possible uh, if there are one or two people we will see what we can do for the next few hours but we are really on to the next stage which is the withdrawal of the military uh, we'll fly out those people we took uh, with us airside and then we will remove our military a thousand personnel from 16 air assault brigade paras uh, three para two para uh, some of the yorks and the rifles who've done an amazing job and um, we'll start getting those out they have done an amazing job i think everyone's very proud of them but did fundamentally uh, mr wallace did the terrorists win no well first of all in the short term the attack yesterday did not change our timetable as you said it delayed some flights and 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 stopped the you know, for a few hours, stop some processing, and hours matter, as as you know, on this process. So uh, they they hurt even more Afghans, is what you could say. Not only who they killed with their bomb, but also uh, you know people's chances of a better life. Uh, the Taliban clearly uh, took the country uh, after the Doha deal. They had consistently made military gains for the last two years, uh, and um, you know. The Taliban are certainly the, the party running the government now. Uh, for now, they haven't formed a government yet, but they are in control of the country. Uh, I've been clear what I thought of the Doha deal, um, but we are where we are. And, you know, what I would say is the professionalism of our soldiers uh, and our civil servants in this process have shown that, uh, you know, the British government will do its very, very best in a very difficult situation. Uh, and we are leaving. And, and you're just on the timetable, Julia, the, when, once the Americans have decided 31st of August, was not going to change uh, we had to uh, obviously we have to leave before them uh, and i would like to pay tribute to them they put in over five to, well, about five to six thousand troops into the airfield to secure it we're doing what we're doing today because they have secured that airfield and tragically they lost 13 marines in doing it um, and uh, they will have to draw down as well uh, from that airport so we have to go a bit before them that crunches the time and that okay. leads us to difficult positions. What, what should those British civilians, uh, people, aid workers, NGOs, uh, what should they and indeed the Afghan interpreters and others who were working, people not just helping the British military, people you know setting up charities, opening girls' schools and the like, people who worked uh, in the infrastructure of the Afghan army, what should they do now? Yesterday I spoke to Samir, that's how we've identified him. He's an interpreter. He worked with the British and other forces in northern Afghanistan. Uh, we believe he is eligible for the UK's uh, Arab resettlement scheme, but he's not been able to get into the airport, hasn't got his paperwork. I'll just play you a very brief clip of what he said to me yesterday. My life, my, my wife's life, my daughter's life is at risk. I don't want my daughter to be without a father because I want her to grow up in a, a country where she can enjoy her life. She, she should study. My wife should study. I should just run my life in a goat man, in a goat way. That's why I'm asking. I appeal, I request British officials to help me, please. 
Well, we, we passed on his details, his real name not being Samir, to uh, uh, James Heap, who spoke to us yesterday, and, and I passed on some of the information to you. You very kindly uh, offered to help look into his, help his case. I realise uh, events overtook everybody yesterday with those horrific bomb attacks. But w- what, what can people like Samir do today? He's got a one-year-old daughter. He is terrified for his life. What should he do? Well, th- there are... I... You know, it's not easy, but um, look, first of all, uh, if possible, and uh, it's not going to be possible for, for a number of people, they should try and make their way to a third country. We will, if necessarily, beef up the uh, visa application centers in a number of these neighboring countries, and we will process them as quickly as possible so that the host country doesn't um, uh, get uh, disturbed by that or, or worried about it and, and then close their own borders, which wouldn't help. Uh, and we will bring them back to the UK. I, you know, my Arab scheme, I will bring back those people. Uh, we have that duty. I will get them here uh, whatever way I can. Uh, and if we can take, you know, we, we have back as far back as April, we took someone from a refugee camp in Greece who had been an interpreter for us. Uh, and we will look at all measures. The Home Secretary has been incredibly supportive in this process with me in doing this. And um, the Foreign Office are ready and are working as we speak uh, to improve the visa routes in the third country so that's the first uh, way i think if you're lower profile than probably the guy you spoke to uh, if you're a lower profile individual uh, you may well be better off uh, effectively uh, waiting not at the airport but in either with relatives or, or places where you feel safe if you can feel safe um, and we will because i, I think in the medium term uh, and the long term, the Taliban will want the airport open. They will want their borders to remain open for trade. I know the Taliban have been uh, uh, exploring how they keep open the airport for, for you know, they need they need flows. You know, <clears throat> the Taliban leadership was living in Doha for a couple of years, uh, the political leadership. Uh, so those type of links are really important to the Taliban okay. and they want a functioning airfield. And then I, then some of our people will be able to get through. And remember, the G7 made it very clear they wanted the international community to put pressure on the Taliban to uphold that safe passage. OK, let's also talk about you know how, how we've left these people. The Taliban have been left not only with $85 billion of US military hardware, including helicopters and planes, and they've also been left with all the data of every single Afghanistan who's helped us. This came out of a Pentagon briefing for US congressmen and women yesterday. Uh, we also now know, front page of the Times today, an uh, extraordinary report that the British embassy left details of Afghan staff, uh, their dates, you know, date, names, addresses, dates of birth, and their telephone numbers even. Uh, for the Taliban to find. Um, I mean, we, we have let a lot of people down unnecessarily, haven't we? Well, look, Julia, on, on the Tony Lloyd's article in The Times, uh, what I would say is, first of all, he, he, he held it back so, yeah. so we could contact some of those people, and I'm very grateful for him. Uh, I, I secondly need to put it in context. I don't know how many thousands and thousands of other bits of paper we did destroy and whether this is a tiny, tiny percentage. It still isn't good enough. I'm not saying it is. We have a absolutely. We should look after their data. We have that duty to those people, uh, and um, you know, I think we'll investigate what actually happened uh, in the embassy and, and why they were left. And you know, what I don't know is how quick and how much pressure our own British officials were under to leave very quickly. And this was the job they they tried to do. But um, fundamentally, you you are right. I mean, there are some things, and I should really tell your listeners so they understand in a few days' time. In order for me to squeeze more time for evacuating Afghans and British passport holders, I had to take what we call risk in the drawdown of our military personnel. I don't mean risk to them, but as in, do we leave some kit behind so I can have more hours to get people out? Uh, give an example, and it, and it may not be, but you know, just making a decision to, to leave a Land Rover, maybe, maybe if you disable it, but leave it, um, w- w- would leave more space on an aircraft and more time to get yeah. people out. And that's just a difficult balance. We're not talking about lethal weapons or anything else like that. But yeah. but those are the choices I have to make. Can I ask you about your, your ongoing row with uh, Penn Farthing, a former Royal Marine, trying to get uh, his... No, uh... no, Julia. I've spent so many... Our officials and our military people have spent a lot of time on this. Uh, I tweeted out yesterday the facts of the issue because a lot of uh, falsehoods and misleading allegations by his UK base. Uh, and, uh, you know, no one blocked a plane. Let's leave it at that. OK. Um, have they have they perhaps uh, stalled the evacuation of other people with the time that's been spent dealing with them? Julia, I've I've if 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 I 
spend any more time on this. Uh, you know, my day today yeah. is getting our British troops okay. out, getting the last remaining Afghans out. The humanitarian crisis, and you know, I've made it clear the position. He was called forward last Friday, pen farthing. He chose not to do that. Uh, he was urged by me on your show or other shows beginning of the week. He he didn't do that. We got to leave to remain for his Afghan uh, people with them. Uh, they didn't get processed in time. And as I've always said, this wasn't about planes on the tarmac. It was about how long it would take you to get through the process. Okay. Ben Wallace, look, I know you've got a busy day ahead. I wish you good speed. Um, there's an awful lot to do to get an awful lot of people out and get them to safety. Defence Secretary Ben Wallace, thank you as always for talking to us on the show.